Hey everybody, my name is Rurik Nakrud and I just defended my core defense, or defended my core paper, which is a, a step in the process towards doing research in my doctorate area, which is game-based learning. And the idea was that I needed to pull together um, the courses that I had taken and contextualize them within the topic area that I am interested in, which is game-based learning. For the purposes of this video, I am just going to go through and share um, what I did in my presentation. It's going to be a little bit abbreviated in places, and there may be parts where I actually don't um, include things that were in my actual presentation. Introducing my um, video is uh, just the topic itself. Is I was looking at game-based learning. I'm actually really interested in, in um, an, a design-based research methodology. So we're looking at some iterative design, looking at how students are engaged in 21st century skill development through games in the schools. So first I need to go over some definitions clearly. Um, I need to define serious games, gamification, game-based instructional practices because these aren't typically understood um, at the university where I'm at. So I just wanted to really quickly go over those. First we have serious games, and gamification, and game-based instructional practices. So when I talk about serious games, I'm talking about a game in which the primary goal is something other than entertainment. Gamification, of course, is using the mechanics of games, um, such as leveling and other things like that, to um, enhance content of curriculum. And then game-based instructional practices, according to my definition and, and um, the citations I use, is the use of instructional methods incorporating existing games with the content or learning principles. Sorry to read that all to you, since it's obviously there, but I did want to be able to define that and then also um, explicate a little bit more. Um, as far as what serious games go, um, I would consider uh, World of Warcraft in schools, the way that that's used to be more um, serious game-like or actually more of a game-based learning opportunity. Um, and then Sim Schools is much more, at least from what I've seen of it, I haven't been able to dive in this deeply, is uh, there's a curriculum already there and then they're, they're employing, um, they're employing game-based practices in order to enhance that curriculum and to, to make it more appealing for students. Um, so those are some examples. And my definitions may not match specifically what those objects are anymore or how that changes. Um, another part of this core paper is um, looking at those who are interested in um, game-based learning. Um, currently, there's a large or a strong interest from both government officials, business leaders, and also the philanthropic community. Um, President Obama uh, put together a, a task force with Constance Stein Cooler heading it up, which was the which was um, she was kind of the video game czar is, I think, how I've seen it in articles. Um, business leaders at EA Games put together um, SimCity EDU, um, and they're putting together more educational uses of their platforms. And then, of course, Bill Gates has been putting some money forward, and other philanthropists have putting money forward, including the George Lucas Foundation, towards using games for education. Um, another component to this is the population in schools right now, and something that's really interesting is that K-12 and higher ed have this generation of students who've had technology their entire lives, they've been playing video games their entire lives, um, and it's just really starting to hit some of the um, institutions how big the need is to actually match some of those, those uses. Um, and it's really interesting in terms of looking at scholarly research, if you t type in Games for Learning in Google Scholar, um, if you're just looking at um, the last several years, um, altogether we have 2 million something results, as, as you can see in this video, but, but if you look at 2011 to 2012, that's just last year um, from when I was doing this research, uh, the number of articles was 30,000 or so um, articles and, and book chapters about games for learning. 
But then if you go ahead and up that to this more recent year, 2012 to 2013, which honestly when I was doing the search um, was at the beginning or the middle of 2013, we're already looking at double the number of articles and, and other work that um, address issues and, and even just um, ideas around gains for learning. Granted, that's a search term, but when we look at some of the older published articles um, that were out, there's a lot of statements like this where it says the success of games in the educational context is not precise science. There's been a dearth of scientific studies analyzing their usage. Well, there has been, but maybe not so much anymore. Um, I think that there's an, a, a remarkable uptake in the amount of research being done with regard to this. Um, for this core paper, I was having to contextualize um, the learning environment, so I had to explain how I viewed games and play, and I really liked Helen Zimmerman's um, explanation of this, where they had games as a subset of play and play as a subset of games, um, and where play, we have tons of different play activities, and some of those play activities may be games, but not all of those. And so in that way, I mean, you can think about games as a part of play, but then at the same time, you reverse that and think play is part of games, and um, the rules, the, the things that we do in games, all the aspects that define games, play is actually a part of that as well. So I really um, enjoyed this, this definition because it allows for some interesting explications um, regarding the use of games, and if we use these definitions, um, it is also really helpful for looking at the research about play, which we have a much longer history of the research of play, um, as you can see from all these quotes that are going to pop up for a little while here. Um, we have a long history of play as a study in education, um, and the importance of play to learning. So if we think about play as being important for learning, then and and play as a subset of games or games are a subset of play either way, uh, games are actually quite powerful and it's an exciting thing to be talking about. Um, one of the things I really love about play is that it's such a powerful motivator, and we've had people talk about um, uh, play as the opposite of work, but honestly, work doesn't get done unless there's some sort of play involved or some sort of enjoyment, um, especially amongst those who we might call Generation Z or Millennials, um, because without some sort of motivation to get work done, the work doesn't isn't accomplished, and we might like to say that um, money should be, is a motivator or was a motivator, but that's not true in our current context as much anymore. Um, as part of this core paper, I also had to um, develop a learning framework, and this is a very brief, brief evaluation of that using the basics. And we're looking here right now at the um, the uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and just basic matching of different games to um, the, the different levels of, of Boom's taxonomy. If you think of bingo or memory, those are both remembering, maybe understanding sorts of games. Um, I think we're applying and analyzing, you can think of role playing games and even some simulations. Um, and then you have analyzing, evaluating, creating. And, and I think one of the greatest creative games available right now is Minecraft. Um, and not only just Minecraft as a game, but like games that allow creativity or even the creation of games really edges up towards those higher level thinking skills. And this is really valuable about the building of games and the use of games, and even just adopting a serious game um, for an educational purpose is that we can jump up to those highest levels of, of thinking much more quickly. And in, a, in an era where we can Google answers at the remembering level, why shouldn't we spend 
the majority of our learning time engaged at the higher level thinking skills. And if games give us access to that, great. Um, here's an example. Um, I actually played through Evil Land a little bit. It's a great little game that kind of does the history of video games. And from a purely behaviorist standpoint, think BF Skinner, uh, you can see how there's action reaction. Uh, there's a lock I can't get through, so my reaction is to move somewhere else. I want to work and new things from these treasure chests, so I've been opening it. I open the treasure chest, I get color. So I'm, I'm very much behaviorist model, model here. Um, got smooth scrolling. Ooh, I really like that. That's fun. I like how I can move and it looks much nicer. Um, I continue looking for treasure chests. I'm really motivated by the idea of treasure chests. I see that there's another one up there, so I'm going to go for that treasure chest. Oh, look, I got an even better display. I'm really getting excited about these treasure chests. So I'm hunting out these treasure chests. So very behavioristic in those terms. I'm even willing to run around these monsters that I got from the last treasure chest um, because I know that there's more treasure chests to be gained. And I run back and forth around with them. I, I just got a sword, so I'm kind of trying it out, trying to see what it does. It apparently destroys bushes that were blocking my path. There's another treasure chest. I got a little bit better resolution. Um, I now have music. These are, you know, all motivating pieces. Um, and in this very behaviorist way, I am slowly changing and developing myself as a player. I'm um, also being very careful about these little monsters that are going to come and get me because um, I want to continue the storyline here. Um, and, and again, it, it, it's um, as it gets complicated, um, the, the scaffolding of this learning experience. Um, I, I've got a key. I don't really know what that is for. I have the ability to talk to NPCs. Nope, I don't have the ability to talk to NPCs. There's a lock here. I have a key, but it's not working. I don't understand. I'm struggling. I'm trying to figure it out, but we've got more complicated. I know that these treasure chests are useful, so I go get another treasure chest. Oh, now I can talk to, to NPCs. Okay, great. Um, he says he wants something shiny. I'm thinking, oh yeah, I picked up a gold coin at one point. So I give him the gold coin. He says, oh, now you can open uh, doors with your keys. Great. So I've kind of, it's becoming more and more complicated. And this is the, at the point that the behaviorist context doesn't work for games. Um, because now it's gotten to this level of, of complication and the interaction and different things happening. And so that's where I like to introduce the idea of constructivism and, and micro worlds. Um, if you think about Horton, here's a who, that's where this flower comes from, is the, the flower that Horton is, is um, holding it with the whole universe of the who's. That interaction between those worlds and the learning that happens as those interactions occur, that much more complicates the, the behaviorist learning environment. Um, and, and now we can think of it as more of a constructivist or even a, a, a constructionist or even a social constructivist learning environment. Um, and so one of the things I really love about this is that in education, if you think about the classroom, the home environment, the curricular um, artifacts that are being used, these all provide um, micro worlds or domains or environments that can be explored and they can be explored like these video games, although the, at, at the beginning of the video game when it was simple was very linear. As it became more complicated, you can explore it in non-linear ways. So users and learners can both explore these little worlds, see the interactions that happen between them, and construct their own learning. Um, and so I was trying to look at this and synthesize a, a framework of what's going on in terms of the learning. Um, and so I was going through several different ideas and theories. Um, there's constructivism and just the basic definition of, of construct, constructionism, um, knowledge and meaning from experiences. And when I say knowledge and meaning from experiences, um, I'm really talking to that experiential cycle in some ways. Um, you have an experience and you construct some knowledge or meaning from that experience. Um, but Vygotsky has shared some really great things um, in terms of play in the zone of proximal development that really help explain and expand that. Um, I'm not actually remembering what my point was during my court offense. Thankfully, I already passed this court offense, so I don't have to actually go back and recall all those details. I'm kind of glad I didn't record it. Um, but 
looking at scaffolding a learning experience, if you think back to that video game, um, each of those steps along the way is were scaffolding the experience so that um, the player learned what should be happening. And I really enjoy how that works in terms of games. Games are really good at slowly building up the experiences. And here's Cole talking about experiential cycle, which is what I think I jumped to really too early with constructionism. Um, but you have an experience, you reflect on the experience, and then you um, try something else out. And, and, and when you look at the video games and the play experience, you go and have your play experience, you learn something, and you, you reflect on it, and you come back and you try something different. Um, it's, really, it's really powerful. And because, as Sasha Garab says, um, video games are a dominant form of play, because they are um, maybe, uh, I, I may not necessarily say dominant, but it, they are the pervasive form of play available in our current society, um, especially when people are afraid of having their kids outside and things like that, it's, it's really powerful to realize that. Um, another portion of the coursework that goes to the core paper was the organizational framework. Um, and I really like to think about education as anarchy. Um, and if you look at this little graphic here, it's going to pause for a second. Um, it's really these loosely coupled systems. And by loosely coupled systems, I have to go back to the analogy of the micro worlds from Pepper. Um, the, the pieces of education don't function in a vacuum, completely detached from each other, but they're they're loosely enough tethered to one another that what impacts one part of the system, say an elementary school in a school district, does not impact another elementary school in that same school district. Uh, the, the, the best third grade teacher at elementary school A um, is sick. That doesn't impact the educational process going on at elementary school B. Um, a new idea is formed and comes from the university for state A, um, that doesn't necessarily impact another university in state A um, or any of the universities in state B. Um, and, and so in some ways, this anarchic system, it hits one part of our educational system or what we do to try to impact the educational system does not pervade and impact the other parts of the, of the system. So um, when we're looking at curricular change and, and reform, it's very difficult to have a pervasive change. Um, and so when I think about game-based learning, it, it's one of the most intimidating aspects of being a curricular change agent, being somebody who really thinks that games have value and importance. How do we bring games out to um, educational systems when it may or may not have an impact. And to kind of refine this idea, because I really truly believe in it, this idea of educational anarchy, um, I think we put a veneer, like Bowman and Deal uh, developed the, the four frames for um, educational organization. I, I really think it's, it's a veneer. We have the human resources frame, and it's about the people. We have the systems uh, framework, and we have the symbolic frameworks, and we have all these little things that we do to kind of make this frustrating, uh, difficult system interpretable and palatable to people who need an organized um, framework. And it gives us this illusion that when we do institute change, that change will actually occur. And um, while I do think that there are truths to these different frames and it's, a, it's an accurate way of interpreting certain instances, I think that overall that, that, that system-wide anarchy um, is a much stronger, a stronger proposal for understanding what's going on in educational systems when we try to bring in curricular reform or other types of reform. Um, we can use the other frames, especially I like using the symbolic frame because it's great to put together a symbol and, and, and organize around a symbol to, to institute yeah. change and to, to, to promote change. But those, those um, symbols may not impact another part of the system. So when, we, when I'm thinking about these broken up systems, it's really, really, truly difficult in an anarchic system. 
Um, and so then another portion of our course is we're going over policies and politics and how those are impacting it. And that's kind of where we look at this organizational structure and like, okay, how can we influence this anarchic system? And I think one of the biggest symbols that we, we argue about and everybody has their own interpretation, what is the purpose of education? Um, and if your purpose of education and my purpose of education are different, and most likely they are, um, then that anarchic system keeps change from happening because we both will continue to push for our own things that keep the loosely coupled systems loosely coupled. Um, but the one thing that I really feel like could be a unifying thing for the purpose of education in our current um, context is the idea of promoting 21st century skills. Um, so to that end, using the UNESCO educational policy framework, I kind of tried to frame game-based learning politically. Um, and right now we have several different policy options available to us um, at the federal level, especially. Um, at the state level and at the institutional level, it's a little bit more difficult to dive into and understand. But I feel like at the federal level, at least, there's a convergence of interests. Um, the academic sphere is highly interested in the potential for games um, and, it's, and it's growing as, as could be seen from the um, little Google search that I was showing. Um, that, that it seems like it's a really potentially positive thing going on over there. Um, we also have funding convergence where philanthropists and businesses are actually getting excited about the opportunities and potential for games for education. And so they're actually putting funding together for that. And then we also have a governmental interest. Um, the federal government especially is interested in use of games. They've already done um, something called America's Army, which was the military using games to recruit and, and um, make potential future uh, soldiers aware of what happens in the army um, or in the military. Um, uh, another thing that's going on right now is there's a bit of an alignment of stakeholders in terms of the uh, games task force. Um, they, they're getting together and they're trying to figure out and, and develop policies supportive of the games for education movement. Um, and this is definitely really going to be interesting. We'll see what happens with this. Um, again, the, the, the anarchic system at the educational level may cause some, some issues um, or potential benefits. In terms of that, I think that we really have a couple of policy options. So one of them is, what if the government is the producer? What if they do, they kind of spearhead, define, and lead everything? And that's where America's Army came from, uh, was the government as producer, they, they basically said, we want this game, they got the right people on board, and they funded it. And that's one policy option. I'm not really a big fan of that, because I'm actually more of a fan of that anarchic system. Um, and I really enjoy this idea of, of facilitation. Um, the government policy decisions as an act of facilitation, uh, encouraging startups, um, connecting players, uh, or since that's a game term, um, connecting constituent groups to certain goals. Um, and then, of course, we could also blend those two ideas. We could have some direct funding for a purpose. I think in a lot of ways, a lot of the games for change that have been developed were funded because the purpose aligned with interests. And, and so um, a lot of the games, especially um, things that Jamie McGonigal has been working on, they either got funding or some sort of blending of purposes towards a, a certain type of game. And so um, where we're going now, don't really know. It depends on what sort of decisions are made, what sort of funds are available, um, and, and all those wonderful pieces. Um, I'm actually really looking forward to it. It's going to be my entire career, actually. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. Um, and I'm so glad I'm done with this court offense. I have moved on. I'm already writing up my literature for my actual dissertation proposal. Um, if you have any suggestions for future 
readings or articles, feel free to send me an email um, or just send me a message via YouTube since you're probably watching this on YouTube. If you're watching this at all, it's really, really not that exciting. I should have said that in the beginning. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to um, being even more engaged with this community and developing my ideas.